So last week it was it was Easter. We we re- we we spoke about and celebrated the light of Christ rising in glory that overcomes darkness and death. We said that there is no darkness that is total, no darkness that is final, that the unwavering love of God, in the unwavering love of God, there is great power to redeem, that in the God that we worship, this is, uh, there is power to bring life from death and to bring into existence things that don't exist. And then uh, Easter Sunday was over, and what happened next? We woke up on Monday morning, and I don't know about you, but for me, it's the, the chronic back pain. That's the thing that really kind of gets me down. It's the recognition now that I'm not, that my body is getting older and those pains are going to be persistent. <laughs> That's one of the things. On Tuesday, it was a reminder of a colleague in ministry who is losing his mother. On Wednesday, I got a call from one of my college friends who had quit his job in desperation and despair because he said that the light had gone dim and that he just couldn't see it anymore. What what happened after... Easter Sunday for most of us is that we went back to life as it is. The reality that we live with its own sense of confusions and doubts and disappointments with all of our own stuff still with us, with all of the things outside of us still there uncertain and unsure, we, we went back to a reality in which many of us, most of us, perhaps all of us, suffer from various kinds of trial. And the question uh, really becomes, how, how, do you, how do you persist in a kind of resurrection Easter hope in a world that's full of suffering and trial? Um. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, one of the books in the New Testament, a letter that was written uh, to a group of people in Asia Minor, and the letter is called uh, First Peter. We're calling the series Wild Hope. Uh, it's a letter that's written to a group of people not unlike ourselves who are living in light of the resurrection of Christ, but also in a world in which they are experiencing the reality of difficulty and suffering and pain, bodily, emotional, spiritual, that's coming from within and without. And so we're going to look at that and we're basically ask the question throughout the series, what does the resurrection of Jesus have to do with our reality, with the life that shows up for us on Monday and Tuesday and, uh, and we're going to think about the resurrection, not just as this abstract idea, but in the throes of life as, they, uh, as, we, find, as we find it. And so um, the, the book in the New Testament, First Peter, is really short. It's easy to read. It's, it's easy in terms of length. You could read it this afternoon. It is dense, and we're going to take it uh, slowly and in turn. Um, Right off the bat, you, you begin to realize that all was not well with the people. Um, you just see it in, in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion, Paul writes, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, the letter, some of the letters of the New Testament are written to one church, one town, one group of people, to the Philippians in Philippi, or the Corinthians in Corinth, or the Romans in Rome. And, and when those letters are written, the writer, most of the time Paul, is addressing particular concerns that arise out of that community. This, uh, in contrast, is a letter that's written to a whole group of people. It's a general letter. It, it's like a circular letter. It would be as if 
our bishop in Mississippi, Bishop James Swanson, penned a letter to the people of North Mississippi, and it circulated from Tupelo to, uh, you know, to Corinth to Ripley to Oxford to Batesville. It, it's uh, a general letter, and it's written and addressed uh, to the exiles of the dispersion. The dispersion refers to uh, the, the Jewish diaspora, which is uh, the, the Jews, their homeland was there in Palestine, but they were dispersed across the, the empire. So they were living in places that were not their homeland. They were living as foreigners and strangers in uh, another land. And the word that uh, is always there in the Old Testament for this reality is the word exile, recalling the time when the Jewish people were in exile, when they were, uh, when their homeland was destroyed, their temple was destroyed, their farms were destroyed, and they were sent by the Babylonian empire into a foreign country. They were in a place that was not their own, where they didn't feel comfortable, where they didn't feel uh, at ease because they were strangers in a foreign land. Exiles of the dispersion. But in verse 1 and 2, he goes, he goes on and he says, uh, it's not only that you're exiled, that you feel strange, that it's not as if you're at home in the world, but also that you're chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified uh, by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. So you get, that's just the greeting of the letter. When I write a letter, I don't do all that. I just say, dear, you know, dear, I don't know, I'm trying to find somebody. Dear Jonathan, that's all I say. I don't do all that. And you probably don't as well. It's a very formal beginning to the letter. But he goes on to, to speak of uh, of a hope that is born uh, out of Easter, out of the resurrection. In verse 3, he writes, uh, it begins with a kind of prayer. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So what did the resurrection of Christ from the dead offer to us offered to humanity. It offered us an opportunity for new birth, for regeneration, for something new to be born in us, and also to a hope that's not just static, but it's living. And also, uh, the other aspect of uh, the resurrection of Christ for, from the dead for, uh, for the early Christians was what Peter calls an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We'll unpack that in a moment. But what is going on here, it really, to understand what is being offered in the prayer, you kind of have to get this next little bit in uh, in verse 6. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is the first clue, or the second clue, after their uh, they're addressed as exiles, as strangers and foreigners in this land. They're not at home. They don't feel comfortable in the world. There's something uh, that's a little bit off between them and the people around them. And then we hear that this is a group of people that are suffering various trials. Now, we have all of our trials, you know, the back pain I was mentioning, the, the emotional stress, the mental uh, uh, just melancholy and, uh, and insecurity and, and pain and trauma that we sometimes experience. But what, the question is really, I mean, what were they experiencing? Some scholars think that they were experiencing persecution. They, they point to letters from emperors in Rome and say what was happening in this region at this time is that 
the Christians in this, this part of the world were experiencing persecution. They could, be, they could be persecuted and perhaps killed for their faith. Maybe not unlike what we saw a week ago in Sri Lanka, where Christians were persecuted and killed and martyred uh, for their faith. Others, looking a little bit more closely at the letter, see, have, have pointed out that, that even though uh, the fact of their suffering is clear, the, the particular nature of it is disputed. You just think about it. It's, it's kind of, if you're talking about a general group of people in North Mississippi, people in North Mississippi right now are experiencing any manner, any number of trials. Not just one thing, but this whole raft of things that are being experienced. But the writer of the letter really puts the emphasis on uh, social ostracism. It's what I experienced when I was in middle school. <laughs> when I would, go, uh, I would go out in middle school thinking that, uh, that the world was there, everybody wanted to be my friend, and what I found was there were people in middle school that were really mean. That what I experienced Maybe you guys didn't experience this, and life has always just been your, you know, the world has always been your oyster, and everywhere you've gone, everybody just brings you on board, and it's great. Well, that wasn't my experience at all. My experience in middle school, and even more so in high school and in college, was not that I always found the social world around me very favorable and everybody wanted to be my friend, but rather that I would go out and at times be confused and estranged and just experience the world as really awkward because the world around me, I just, there was this alienation and separation and difference between me and the world around me, and it caused me to suffer various trials. And of course, that's just me. I know it's not y'all. But I think there's, this is kind of what uh, is underlined in the letter. It's first, they suffered various trials. Later in the letter, it talks about a fiery ordeal. It speaks of suffering in terms of verbal and not simply physical attacks, speaking against, slandering, insulting, reproaching, reviling. So the early church, they're experiencing some kind of hostility, but it's not physical necessarily. It's not persecution and being killed. It's, it's I mean, not to say that there, there may not have been some kind of lo- local mob attack that would break out against the Christians from time to time, but I think that what is being emphasized is this kind of verbal uh, verbal speaking against. It's, it's the reality of a group of people who are confronting uh, the world around them and experiencing difference and trials because of the way they're being treated by other people. They're suffering from various kinds of trial. Now, of course, that, uh, that, that experience of trial, it extends beyond whatever they were experiencing uh, to to everyone who has read the letter since then, and when you when you think about the kinds of trials that we experience, the the reality of them is the same. What happens is you end up with your head turned down. You're unable to think to the past. You can't think to the future. You're just stuck in the moment, and you don't think you're ever gonna be able to live in the world without a day or week or month or year going by that you're not just stuck in the midst of it. I've got a buddy of mine who's had a difficult year where nothing has gone right in his work for the entire year. And they've had to uh, sell off things that they didn't want to sell off and think about selling their house and think about changing the way that they live. And it it felt as if the work was never going to come through. And finally, he got a business deal to go through. And it's going to be, they're going to have the kind of month this month that's going to set them up for the year. And he was having, he had a great week this past week. But this is what he said. He said, you know, Chris, I just worry. (laughs) I I can't even really get excited about any of this because I'm, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. There's, there's this experience of the world as if it's closed in and the horizon is not open and, and it's closed and, and it creates this kind of uh, deep sense of just being caved in. And there's something like that happening in the passage that we identify with in our own suffering, in our bodily, in our emotional or spiritual 
trials that we've experienced, that we identify with when we read the, the letter. And what's offered to them is what's called this living hope, a new birth through the resurrection of Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled, unfading. So instead of thinking about their beginnings as terrible, they can think about their beginnings as something, something new, a new beginning, a new birth, that something new could be born. And when they think about their future, they can think about an inheritance, as if the horizon of their future is open to something that cannot be taken away. In a world of instability, it's stable, it's unper- imperishing and undefiled and unfading. It's protected for them. And in the present, they're protected by the power of God to live in the world. And that's what's offered so that they can experience suffering not just as the thing itself, as something that is destructive and taking something away from them, but rather as something more. As something that, that you're experiencing as, as almost like a test by fire. It's as if you are gold tested by fire and your faith is being refined and tuned and honed in on so that what you have in the world is more genuine and it's more precious than gold and it is leading in the direction of something like God. God is holy and you are to be holy and that's what's offered, that's what Peter offers to these exiles of the dispersion who were suffering from various trials. And the question I keep kind of asking myself is this, can their hope be our hope? I mean, can the hope of this letter that is kind of at a distance, that when you read it, it can feel dense and a little bit obtuse and, and far away, can, can this hope that's offered to them be our hope? Because what I'm aware of is that when I start talking about trials and suffering, that if you're experiencing trials and suffering right now, then, then you may feel like I'm minimizing or diminishing what you're experiencing because I have no idea what's going on on the inside of your world today. Suffering, trial, is very difficult to talk about. It's very difficult to write about, but it's even harder to do. Most people that I know that are in pain, who are suffering, don't have a lot of mental energy to write about or speak about it. All of their capacity is given over to just surviving in the world. That's why a lot of what is written about or said about pain or trial or suffering comes off just feeling so hollow. Because there's this, it, there's this perceived just unbridgeable gap between those who are experienced th- experiencing that reality and those who attempt to talk about it. So I'm aware of those, of those things as I, as I speak. Um, I've, I've told some of you before that my New Testament professor, Luke Timothy Johnson, uh, had a wife who was in need of care. And one time she was in the hospital And when he says he was young and more stupid than he is today, he tried while she was in the hospital to read to his wife out of the book of Job when she was in serious pain. He writes this, I discovered quickly that words of great nobility cannot even be heard by someone whose body is being tortured. Eventually, I learned that simple silence And holding her hand was better than any eloquence, even the eloquence of the Bible. And so if that's where you are today and you're experiencing trial or pain or suffering, my words may sound hollow to you, and I I understand that. But what I I want you to know is that that Eddie, our senior pastor, and I are, are here. We're here after the service if you'd like to come forward and pray but also we're, we're here through the week. Um, we're always available for conversation. We also have a lot of resources in Oxford. We have a ton of incredible counselors and therapists who work in this community, and those resources are available to you if you're experiencing those realities.
And so I'm really hesitant to, to move forward and to talk about hope if you're experiencing those things, because I know that my words can sound hollow, but there's really, there are really just a couple reasons why I persist. I feel like I need to say a couple more things. One is that the, the book of First Peter uh, nudges us in that direction, and also I just see so much bad Christian theology about these things, I feel like we need to talk a little bit more about them. Um, typically, when people talk about suffering and pain in the present, they, they talk about it as, it, as if it's an entirely negative reality. Sometimes suffering is even identified with evil and happiness with, with good. And we begin to take on the idea that life without pain is the only way to be happy or life without suffering is the only way to be happy. And so we need to avoid any form of suffering at all costs, even if we need to self-medicate and anesthetize ourselves from periods of of suffering. In the Old Testament, there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament along these lines. Human suffering uh, is, is viewed differently. In the Old Testament, it's closer to what I think most people think about in contemporary culture. They think that suffering can be a sign that something's wrong. If things are going well, then it means that God is blessing you and giving you blessings, and blessings be popping, and you are, you're doing great, and everything's wonderful because you are being blessed by God with righteousness and long life and progeny and prosperity and security and a, and a really well-lined bank account. But if not, if, if you're experiencing poverty or barrenness or illness or instability or early signs of death, it must mean that God is cursing you. Now, of course, in the Old Testament, you've got these voices like Job or Ecclesiastes that push back on that, but that's the dominant thread. In the New Testament, though, there's a different way of thinking about suffering. It's shaped not by infusion of a new philosophy or a new set of ideas, but a new experience of God in Jesus Christ on the other side of death and resurrection that enabled human beings to think about suffering in ways that they had never thought about suffering before. First off, in the ministry of Jesus, in his life and death and resurrection, you see a mode of suffering, like a suffering servant that is not simply destructive, not simply something that removes from humanity, but something that can be, not always, but can be constructive. You see in Jesus, God's own life identifying and standing with and entering into human suffering and knowing it from the inside in such a way that we should never doubt that God has abandoned us when we've experienced those things, but rather know that God is there with us in our pain and trial and suffering, but also that if Christ is raised from the dead by the power of God and the and the crucified life of Jesus has been gathered up and taken up into the very life of God, then something else is possible within the experience of suffering that humanity had never thought before, that it can also be constructive. And it's that kind of logic that enables Peter to say in verse 6, in this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have been made to suffer, that you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed." This kind of logic is not to say that God causes our suffering so that something can be made from it. Don't hear me wrong. It's not that God is causing our suffering so that we can have hope. It's rather that in the experience of suffering, we can know that God shares our experience, has entered into it in order to create the possibility for something new. God has taken up the suffering of humanity to dignify our experience and to offer us the capacity to have some new kind of hope that we didn't think was available. 
before. Reynolds Price, uh, whose novels and stories about ordinary people in rural North Carolina struggling to find their place in the world, established him as one of uh, the most important voices in modern Southern fiction during his lifetime. He died in 2011. He was a man of deep faith, and in 1984, when Dr. Price was 51 years old, a large cancer was discovered on his spinal cord that led him to undergo surgery and radiation. At the end, he experienced paralysis uh, from the waist down. He wrote about the experience in a book called A Whole New Life. In the book, he wrote about how one of the experiences, one of, he wrote about how when uh, a significant trauma occurs or happens in your life, your mate, your children, your friends, anyone who knew and loved you before in your old life will be hard at work trying to convince you that your old self can be rediscovered and uh, will try to help remind you and say that you're still who were, you still are who you were. But what Price said is that, that that's not what he needed to hear in that moment of change and challenge. Instead, he said, the kindest thing that anybody could have said to me at that time when I had finished five weeks of, re- of radiation would have been to look me square in the eye and say, Reynolds Price is dead. Who will you be now? The kindest thing that anybody could have said would have been to say, Reynolds Price is dead. Who will you be now? What he needed to hear most, he wrote, is come back to life, whoever you'll be. Come back to life, whoever you'll be. What has been is dead, and you can't go back to that. The old self is dead, but that doesn't mean that there can't be something new. That God's power that raised Christ from the dead can bring into your existence and experience of the world something new, that you can be reborn and remade into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishing and undefiled and unfading and is stored up for you, that the horizon of your present experience can be opened up something new that gives you hope, not just for what you're going through now, but that will be a persistent source of hope in the midst of any trial and any suffering. Can that hope be yours? Can you take on board the prayer? Can you pray it over and again? Can you take the words of 1 Peter and make them your own, even if you don't believe them, right? Sometimes you say the words of Scripture and you don't have within that the content of faith. And that's okay, because sometimes the words of Scripture that have been stored up for you, they can be formative. They can be, the desi- in saying them and memorizing them and writing them, you can be expressing not your deepest held belief, but your desire to have a deeper faith and belief. You can be expressing not your deepest hope, but your desire for God to break in and give you something new. And we'll be here Sunday after Sunday with a community of love and forgiveness, regardless Make this prayer your prayer. Let's, let's pray it together. Verse 3. Together we say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Make that prayer your prayer.
knowing that the present is not all there is. God is bringing something new. Let's pray. Come into this place, O oh Lord. Speak to our hearts, those with deep faith and no faith, those with deep doubt and assurance and confidence. Deepen our sense of who you are and who you desire us to be.